Good morning, everyone. I want to, the subcommittee will come to order. I want to welcome everyone to today's hearing on addressing the broken sustainable growth rate formula by which the federal government reimburses our local doctors for treating Medicare patients. While this is our third hearing, the SCR has been a focal point of the first two as well. The first hearing was on redesigning the Medicare benefit package to make it more rational and responsive to seniors and Medicare patients. In that discussion, we heard that solving the SJR problem is key to maintaining a strong Medicare program. Second hearing was on the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission recommendations for improving the various payment systems. In that discussion, we heard that now is the time to repeal the SGR. I couldn't agree more with both of these sentiments. We need to repeal the SGR so that seniors continue to have access to their local doctors. Physicians, we know, are understandably frustrated. In our communities, we're witnessing firsthand how the current broken system is forcing doctors to rethink their future with Medicare, consider closing their private practices or joining up with a hospital and who can blame them. The SGR is a major contributor to an unhealthy system and it needs to change this year. We need to reform the physician payment system to reward high quality care to patients and value to health care. The current fee for service payment system treats all services the same. It fails to take into account the quality of the care provided or how efficiently that care was furnished. This needs to change too. Building on the subcommittee's efforts in the 112th Congress, Chairman Dave Camp and I joined with our counterparts on the Energy and Commerce Committee to engage with physician organizations and other stakeholders on how best to achieve this goal. These stakeholders have provided extensive feedback on two iterations of the proposal that would first repeal the SCR, provide a period of payment stability, then reward quality and value by using metrics that physicians believe in, and then finally allowing physicians to voluntarily opt for alternative payment models if they better meet their needs. This hearing enables the subcommittee to hear from a few of the many organizations that provide a constructive response to these proposals. The subcommittee will benefit from their exp experience and insights. The hearing also provides the subcommittee the opportunity to hear some perspectives that complement the voice of the physician specialty organizations. These perspectives will help us understand that the payment system improvements we envision for Medicare can be accomplished. More importantly, this hearing will help the subcommittee roll up its sleeves and get on with the hard work of, the, of developing a viable physician payment reform policy. And crafting this policy need not be a partisan exercise. While we certainly have our differences, permanently fixing the SGR this year is a shared goal. I'm pleased that the majority and the minority jointly selected the witnesses we will hear from shortly. This is an important step in the effort to find a bipartisan policy solution. My hope is that we continue to collaborate as we talk to physicians on an ongoing basis. While finding the money to pay for an SGR replacement policy remains a challenge, the most recent Congressional Budget Office SGR repeal estimate surely helps. Using its new Medicare spending projections, CBO estimates that freezing Medicare physician payments at their current level over a 10-year period would cost $138 billion. This is significant reduction from its $243 billion estimate for the same policy just a few months before. I do look forward to working with my friends on the other side of the aisle when we start talking about how to pay for the NSGR solution we'll eventually have to go down that hard road, not only to pay for it, but also to address our spending problems. But let's put that aside for now. Let's work together as Republicans and Democrats engage with physicians and other stakeholders to get the payment reform policy right. The goal is not a perfect policy, but a good, sound policy. Let's craft one that builds on the momentum of the dialogue that continues here today and takes advantage of the more favorable CBO cost estimate. Together, let's get it done this year. Uh, before I recognize Ranking Member McDermott, for the purpose of an opening statement, I ask unanimous consent that all members' written statements be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered, I now recognize Ranking Member McDermott for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, think you were looking over my shoulder. You wrote my speech <laughs> and read it. 
Um, this committee has been wrestling with the need to reform Medicare's physician payment system for more than a decade. <clears throat> but for a variety of reasons, Congress has not yet uh, been able to send a proposal to the President. Uh, we may have a rocky road ahead, but I hope this year we can succeed. We can't afford not to. The sustainable growth rate formula is fundamentally broken. As Congress acted to override the formula's cuts, the hole has been dug deeper every year. And uh, let's be honest, no one ever expects that we're going to cut 30 percent in fees. But the uncertainty promotes profound discomfort and instability in the system. It's patently unfair to ask physicians or others paid under the fee schedule to live with the sort of Damocles hanging over their head year after year after year. And I understand we can't just repeal it and move to an unrestrained inflationary debate er, uh, update. But the SGR's threat has dampened physician spending, even if, even if it has been a series of dysfunctional changes, often last-minute efforts to avert disaster. Instead, we need to replace it with a sensible policy that reflects a more modern care delivery system. We need a policy that rewards quality, not quantity. We need a policy that in gives incentives for teamwork, coordinated care with strong primary care components. We need a policy that helps promote getting the right care to the right patient at the right time. More than anything, we want provider accountability. Now, let's be clear, and I know it as well as anybody on the panel, this is a difficult set of objectives. They won't be accomplished with one fell swoop. They're not going to be, there's no silver bullet in this business, but it's the time to take some steps forward in this challenge. We don't have to start over. We can build on what works and what's already working out there in some places. We should use physician expertise to develop measures, but we must have an accountable public actor as the ultimate ar arbiter. Looking at the ruck, among other things, makes it clear that we can't afford to yield such critical decision making to unaccountable or self-interested private organizations. There's too much at stake. The cost is still high, but it's lower than it's been in years, and the cost of inaction and more patches will be higher still over time. I'm pleased the chairman seems to want to work together on this replacement policy. As he said, the choice of the witnesses was done jointly, which was really a revolutionary experience in the House of Representatives. I don't know if it went on in any other committee ever before, but it's a good step. Uh, next, we'll be drafting. We hope we can do the drafting together. Uh, the chairman's outlines are a good start, but without some detail, uh, we'll have to find out where the common ground is. It's like being invited to go to three cities in Europe. I would like to know which city we're going to uh, before I sign up totally for the trip, but I'm, I am very much involved in wanting to go on a trip. Now, given the bipartisan interest in this, I want to acknowledge that paying for this endeavor will likely be the cause of the most controversy and potential disagreement. It will be difficult, if not impossible, for me and many other Democrats to support a package that is financed by shifting costs onto beneficiaries, especially given that there are other off offsets that are available. This policy could be entirely financed by ending a windfall that was created uh, by the Congress uh, for Big Pharma when we enacted the Medicare Part D. Again, the average Medicare beneficiary has a household income of $22,500. No one should ever forget that. And the average physician income, on the other hand, is about $180,000. I won't support Robin Hood in reverse, especially when people have paid into the program for deficits for decades. But I thank the chairman for holding this hearing, but more importantly, I, show, I thank him for showing an interest in a bipartisan approach. The Medicare program and the nation will be better for it. And I think that today's testimony, I'm looking forward to it because it's a good start. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Today we'll hear from five witnesses, Dr. David Hoyt, Executive Director of the American College of Surgeons, Dr. Kim Allen Williams, past president, American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. Dr. Charles Cutler, the Chair and the Board of Regents, American College of Physicians. Uh, Dr. Frank Opelka, Vice Chair, Consensus Standards Approval Committee, the National Quality Forum. And Dr. Patrick Cornier, Health Plan Medical Director for Health Partners. Thank you all for being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. 
You'll all be recognized for five minutes uh, for the purposes of providing your oral remarks, and we'll begin questioning after that. Dr. Hoyt, we'll begin with you. Thank you, Chairman Brady, Ranking Member McDermott, and members of the committee. I'm David Hoyt, the Executive Director of the American College of Surgeons. On behalf of the more than 79,000 members of the college, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the reform of Medicare physician payment system and to highlight some challenges moving forward that are described in greater detail in the college's February and April letters that have been uh, submitted for the record. The college appreciates the committee's continued commitment to address the complex problems facing Medicare's physician payment system and applauds your work and inclusiveness. In our February letter, the college outlined our value-based update, VBU, proposal to reform physician payment, uh, the physician payment system. We believe that any new payment system must be based on the complementary objectives of improving outcomes, quality, safety, and efficiency while simultaneously reducing the growth in health care spending. The VBU proposal is based on the college's 100 years of experience in creating programs to improve surgical quality and patient safety, such as the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, or NISQIP. We have learned that measuring quality improves patient care, increases the value of health care services, and reduces costs. The savings gained are a direct result of improving quality outcomes. We agree with the Joint Commission proposal uh, that a full repeal of the SGR and a period of payment stability are prudent first steps in reforming the system, while longer-term reforms are developed, tested, and phased in over several years. The college believes that the phase one period of payment stability should be for five years. If we are to move to a value-based system, it is imperative that we make sure the payment models and the quality measures, which will serve as the backbone of the new system, are properly aligned, and that will take some time. The college urges this Congress to provide statutory payment rates tied to inflation during the period of stability. Such stability will allow physicians to make necessary capital investments in their practices to move to a value-based system. In phase two of the joint proposal, the college believes that the most critical component to successfully establishing a base payment rate tied with a variable rate is that it incentivizes high quality care and does not just function through a withhold. Providers willing to take on the risk based on performance associated with the variable rate must first see a starting base rate and an appropriate level to cover the work and expenses required to provide the necessary care. We believe that the base rate should be based on the market value at the end of five years of stability. The college further believes that once the starting base rate is appropriately determined, subsequent base rates should account for the increased cost of providing care by increasing with inflation. It is crucial that the variable rate not only require a level of risk by physicians that may result in a reduced payment, but it is also contains a level of reward that with increased payment for those physicians who achieve the highest quality care. The cost savings we have seen through our quality programs are in the money saved by the improved outcomes. We believe that a variable rate should be determined as to whether a physician meets a specific performance threshold. For a new system to flourish, we must encourage those high performers to share their techniques with those who do not meet the performance threshold. Whether a physician experiences an increase or decrease from the base rate should be determined by performance compared to standards or thresholds. We would like to emphasize that a zero-sum budget-neutral scoring methodology for the variable rate could significantly hamper collaborative care, the sharing of best practice amongst providers, and hinder our ability to recognize all the possible savings. In our century of experience, the college has learned that the real cost savings are best realized from coordinated care. Numerous elements of the committee's proposal relative to performance measurement are strictly specialty or service-based. In contrast, our VBU proposal, which centers on clinical affinity groups, breaks down the silos of physician care. The CAGs, which have, been, have collective quality and performance measures, are designed to be inclusive of multiple specialties working in concert to treat the patient. In developing quality and performance measures, the college believes that we must be able to provide sufficient measures representing all specialties. 
The committee's proposal on measure development could lead to potential conflict between measures that go through the NQF process and those that use the proposal's suggested non-NQF process. The college recognizes that there are challenges with the NQF approval process but that, uh, that have led to frustration among specialties and physicians. However, with the possibility of multiple entities approving measures, there exists the real possibility the physicians could be compared with each other while not pursuing the same measure set. Alternative measure sets need clear evidence of effectiveness if they are to be used. Finally, the college believes that it is incumbent upon every physician and health care provider to commit to being a, res a responsible steward of the nation's health care resources. Physicians and other providers will work together to achieve cost savings, with, and those savings cannot be constrained by the current financing silos of the Medicare program. As physicians work to bring costs down, those savings should be accessible to those who are achieving the savings, whether in parts A, B, C, or D. We appreciate the opportunity to address the second draft of the joint proposal and look forward to working as partners in forging a new patient-centric, quality-based health care system. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Hoyt. <laughs> Dr. Williams, uh, we'll reserve five minutes for your discussion. Thank you, Chairman Brady, Ranking Member McCain. Can you hit that microphone, Doctor? There we go. Got it. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman Brady, Ranking Mem Member McDermott, and other distinguished members of the Ways and Means Health Subcommittee. We thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, otherwise known as ASNIC. ASNIC is a leader in education, advocacy, and quality for the field of nuclear cardiology that was founded in 1993 and represents about 4,600 physicians, technologists, and scientists worldwide dedicated to the science and practice of nuclear cardiology. My name is Kim Allen Williams. I was formerly president of, of ASNIC and I'm currently a member of the Health Policy Steering Committee. ASNIC and many other uh, specialty societies are encouraged very much by the committee's uh, solicitation of physician input on the SGR repeal and the development of alternative reimbursement and delivery models. This partnership is very likely to lead to legislation that reflects the intricacies of clinical practice and, and advances best practices. To that end, I'd like to propose that we talk a little bit about clinical data registries. ASNIC was the, in, involved very much in the development of appropriate use criteria in partnership with several other organizations in order to reduce the number of inappropriately ordered uh, and performed tests. Decisions support tools such as guidance on the proper use of stress protocols and tracers are important initial steps in quality imaging, and ASNIC will continue to collaborate in the development of decision support tools to assist referring physicians and nuclear cardiology professionals. To further assure appropriateness and patient-centered imaging, ASNIC is currently establishing the groundwork for a cardiovascular imaging registry. This will begin with nuclear cardiology, but hopefully will be expanded to further mo uh, other modalities in, in cardiac imaging in the future. This is a natural progression of prior quality initiatives such as clinical application guidelines, imaging procedure guidelines, physician certification, laboratory accreditation, and the appropriate use criteria. We do envision that the imaging registry will be a, a major instrument uh, in allowing the development of a robust set of clinical performance metrics of interest to private payers, uh, as well as Medicare and Medicaid and other policy matrix. These metrics may add further weight to the reality that medical imaging is good medicine and inform proper reimbursement and performance incentives. Advances in medical imaging really have changed the way that physicians take care of patients on a daily basis and integrating medical technology into care plans can save costs by lowering the amount of, uh, of wasteful and ineffective invasive testing and treatments. As stated, the, our hope is that ASNIC can develop the groundwork and, and uh, define initial quality metrics. The initial phase of the registry development hopefully is going to be at the end of 2013, first quarter of 2014 and will be focused on data collection and foundational performance metrics that relate to radiation safety and dose protocols, timeliness of reporting of test results, and clinical indications, most importantly. The registry, registry results will be focused on building the resources related to implementation of patient-centered imaging protocols and, and reporting of appropriate use. In subsequent phases in 2015 and 2016, ASNIC intends to develop the capability to follow the patient through the continuum of care 
Partnerships with other registries in the field of cardiology will assist this initiative. We can track adherence to appropriate use criteria and the resultant treatment decisions uh, such that the uh, cardiovascular imaging registry may illustrate that nuclear cardiology does affect downstream costs uh, in a positive way uh, through more appropriate selection of patients uh, who need invasive and further, further therapies. We expect that the metrics that we develop will be enable Congress and CMS to gauge ongoing clinical improvement initiatives and with this data effectively tie reimbursement to these initiatives. Credits should be given for quality improvement initiatives that are already in place and ongoing, not just for new initiatives each year. And we should, there should be broader uh, ongoing recognition for achieving and, and maintaining uh, board certification, lab accreditation, uh, performing laboratory quality ass assurance, and participation in registries such as the one proposed by ASNIC. These are inter integral quality in, uh, activities and we would hope that annual metric updates uh, would not ignore these ongoing quality measures uh, simply by looking for new initiatives uh, less related to quality. Financial incentives should be provided to physicians who participate in registries, receive feedback, and address any quality deficiencies that are discovered. In terms of the uh, reward for clinical uh, improvement of activities and pay for performance, we embrace the methodology that rewards uh, the specialties advancement in care and quality improvement activities. And we're, we expect that in a system of fee for, for service, provided that that continues, ASNIC would, pr would propose that uh, physicians are awarded with the highest levels of, uh, when they have the highest levels of performance, uh, an increment above the baseline um, uh, fee schedule and with negative updates for those who are not performing and not participating and not improving. Um, so we are actually in favor of that concept. In terms of the stability of the physician reimbursement, uh, the SGR framework, we applaud all of the efforts to try and uh, re uh, rework this uh, in such a way that uh, there are not shocks to the system of physicians and, and their businesses, and uh, we really want to uh, um, try and replace this with quality measures that can be uh, very much cost savings. Great. Doctor, thank you very much for your testimony. Dr. Cutler? My name is Charles Cutler. I'm chair of the, I'm, I'm chair of the Board of Regents of the American College of Physicians. The college represents 133,000 internal medicine physicians and medical student members. I am a full-time primary care internist, internist in a multi-specialty group practice in Norristown, Pennsylvania. The college wishes to thank subcommittee chairman Brady and ranking member McDermott for convening this hearing. We also thank chairman Camp and energy and commerce chairman Upton for proposing a bold plan for Medicare payment reform that holds the promise of breaking a decade-long impasse on the SGR repeal. We thank Representative Schwartz for her leadership in sponsoring, along with Representative Heck, the Medicare Physician Payment Innovation Act. This bill, which we support, has a similar approach as the Campton-Upton proposal and merits strong consideration. The college believes that the Camp Upton plan has four key elements needed to create a viable Medicare payment system. It repeals the SGR, it stabilizes payments, it phases in value-based models and provides multiple pathways for physicians to participate in efforts to improve quality and effectiveness. We request that the committee consider adding the following five policies to the chairman's proposal. First, establish annual positive baseline updates for all physicians for at least the next five years, with a higher update for evaluation and management services. Second, create opportunities for physicians to qualify for additional incentive updates on a graduated scale for participating in a CMS-approved or deemed value-based initiative starting in 2014. Third, create a process by which CMS could deem a private sector initiative 
to qualify physicians for graduated incentive payments. Fourth, we support rigorous standards for DEAM programs to ensure that they improve quality and effectiveness. And fifth, enable practices that have received independent recognition as patient-centered medical homes to qualify for the graduated incentive program. Thousands of physician practices providing care to tens of millions of privately insured patients have achieved accreditation as patient-centered medical homes. Extensive data demonstrates their effectiveness, yet Medicare's support for this model is mostly limited to several hundred practices participating in Medicare, Medicare's comprehensive primary care initiative. These practices are paid their usual fee-for-service payment plus a monthly risk-adjusted care coordination payment for each patient plus the opportunity for shared savings. In return, they agree to be evaluated by a robust metrics, set of metrics. But even for these practices, traditional fee-for-service remains the single largest part of their Medicare payment. Medicare payment policies should also recognize the far greater number of recognized patient center medical home practices that are delivering high quality coordinated care to all of their patients, including Medicare practices, which nonetheless receive no support from Medicare other than the usual fee for service payment. Related, the NCQA has a new medical home neighborhood accreditation program for specialty practices that meet standards related to the coordination of care, creating a pathway for non-primary care specialists potentially to qualify for incentive payments. The bottom line is patient-centered medical homes have the track record to be scaled up and supported by Congress now. Finally, following five years of stable and positive payments during which physicians could qualify for additional value-based incentive payments, Congress could set a date by which time physicians would be in a new payment model or a deemed program or be subject to redu reduced annual payment updates with hardship exceptions excluded. We believe the most effective approach, however, is to create positive incentives for physician-led models that when supported by an improved payment system will enable physicians to deliver better and more effective care. Thank you for listening today. Thank you, Dr. Cutler. Dr. Opelka. Thank you, Chairman Brady and Ranking Minority Member McDermott and committee members for inviting me to participate in today's hearing on behalf of the National Quality Forum. My name is Frank Opelka. I am the Vice Chair for the NQF's Consensus Standards Approval Committee, the CSAC, which I will chair coming this July. The CSAC oversees measure endorsement at the NQF. My day job is the Executive Vice President for Health as, at Louisiana State University and Associate Medical Director of the American College of Surgeons. The NQF was founded in 1999 as a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with members spanning all of healthcare, beginning with specialty society physicians, patient advocates, hospitals, businesses, and more. The NQF has two main roles convene its members to endorse performance measures and to recommend to HHS which measures best fit within the various CMS payment programs. I'm here today because without the NQF, we would have hundreds of measures from specialty societies, from health plans, and others bombarding physicians and hospitals with a sea of their favorite but very different measure preferences making it untenable for me or for my hospital to report meaningful measures to help patients. Just imagine the confusion of five different measures for a heart attack, one from each major health plan, or one from those associated specialties caring for the heart disease, or different measures for the same surgical operation. Which measure would we choose to report? Which result should a patient use? Mr. Chairman, we commend you and the entire committee for undertaking the critical task of reforming physician payment and for placing quality at the center. To focus on quality will only work if the measurement tools are themselves high fidelity. To have an impact, quality measures must first have physician input 
to establish the highest medical and scientific standards. That is why over 400 physicians volunteer alongside experts from hospitals, patient advocates, and business groups joining together to total over 850 individuals volunteering to serve on NQF committees. Mr. Chairman, the measurement work of the NQF is predicated on delivering results that improve care, work toward affordability, and inform patients. Some examples of NQF endorsed measures have, as noted in the CDC report, helped promote 58 percent reduction in central line infections between 2001 and 2009, saving more than 6,000 lives and estimated $1.8 billion in cost. The NQF measures in physician groups across Wisconsin work to lower cholesterol and improve breast cancer screening when compared to other physician, physician groups outside the NQF across the tri-state region. NQF measures added in reducing mortality rates in 650 hospitals using the endorsed safe practices of the NQF. NQF endorsed perinatal measures promoted a limit on newborn deliveries prior to 39 weeks, reducing the need for newborns in ICUs by 16% in, in 27 hospitals. <clears throat> so what does the NQF mean to me? The NQF takes measured developers and takes their measures and convenes specialty society experts along with patients and business groups to assess measures for their importance to patients, for their scientific properties, for their feasibility for the burden of implementation and the meaningfulness to the end users, physicians, hospitals, and patients. Of the measures proposed, 70% are, are approved with over 700 measures now in the measure library. 27% of those measures now are patient outcome measures. Rigorous standards are needed so that we don't misclassify physicians or hospitals or create a misinformed market above, uh, about providers. Improvement, quality, reduced cost, and informed patients deserve this rigorous NQF endorsement. For me, ensuring an NQF endorsement process allows for rapid inclusion of all interested parties and avoids the confusion of a thousand flowers blooming if too many efforts crowd the measure space and lack coordination. I seek your continuing support for this rapidly emerging science of healthcare performance measures with the standards set by the NQF. The process is well balanced with experts led by specialty society physicians and input from business groups and patient advocates. The NQF continuously redesigns its processes with strong guidance from the medical profession, from those patient advocates, businesses, and from CMS. The NQF is the most assured means for coordinating all the voices in transforming our national health care through measure endorsement, avoiding creating confusion from competing standards. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony to Ways and Means Committee. I am happy to answer your questions and elaborate further on any points I've made during my testimony. Thank you, Dr. Cornier. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Brady, Ranking Member McDermott, and the members of the House Ways and Means Subcommittee. I'm Dr. Patrick Cornier, Medical Director for Health Partners Health Plan in Minneapolis, serving Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the surrounding states, as well as a national network. We're a nonprofit, consumer governed healthcare organization serving more than a million patients and more than 1.4 million health plan and dental members. We have nearly 50,000 members who are Medicare patients and one of the nation's few five-star Medicare plans. While we operate a care delivery system, more than 60 percent of our health plan members get their care from our contracted network, which includes groups of all sizes. We appreciate the opportunity to lend our perspective on this important issue. I also wish to thank the Alliance of Community Health Plans for helping to bring our work in this regard to your attention. At Health Partners, we share the broad goals outlined in the SGR repeal and reform proposal, and we strongly support the shift from fee-for-service to value-based payment, and we applaud the bipartisan effort in Congress to achieve it. In particular, we agree that three phases, those three phases outlined in the proposal provide a sensible, workable framework for developing a viable physician payment system for Medicare. Over the past two decades, we and other organizations in Minnesota have used a similar sequence to achieve meaningful progress toward performance-based payment reform in our state. Minnesota is known for having large multi-specialty care systems and large not-for-profit health plans. We sometimes hear that what works in Minnesota's market 
and its structure could not work in other markets. We believe strongly that is not the case. The elements of Minnesota's payment reform are rec replicable and scalable and provide a real-world example for the rest of the country, including Medicare. And because much of the piloting of this work is complete and powerful tools are already established, we suggest that broader implementation could produce results even faster than they have in our state. I'd like to illustrate with a brief example from my own personal experience. I'm a health plan medical director, but I'm also a board-certified family physician with 25 years of clinical experience. By instinct, I see performance-based payment through the lens of a 13-physician family practice clinic in Minneapolis that I once helped to run. Our small practice served a broad range of patients, from affluent middle class to first-generation Hmong, Somali, Eritrean, and Korean immigrants. We accepted a broad range of insurance coverage, including Medicare and Medicaid. In the 1990s, as we sought to prove our value against larger systems, we responded to the early cost and quality transparency initiatives emerging in Minnesota. At that time, using a paper-based system and supported by bonus payments from health plans and a local health plan-sponsored quality collaborative, our small clinic was able to perform as well as or better than the largest groups in our market on clinically important quality measures. We learned just how much improvement is possible if the market signals are right and support is present. It was an example of a small clinic system serving a diverse population competing on a level measurement playing field with the big systems and doing well. And still today, some of our market's best performers are small primary care groups. More important, in the past four years, these same groups have sustained or improved quality performance while working with new total cost of care payment models that drive attention to resource use in an environment of accountability for quality. The sequence, quality and experience first, followed by focus on efficient resource use is the right pathway. In our example, our communities would not really accept a focus on cost until we could demonstrate the ability to improve quality on measures of acknowledged importance to patients and clinicians. Second, until clinicians had the skills and experience in quality improvement, they would not be able to uh, develop the confidence that they could effectively manage costs as these new payment models unfolded. As a health plan during the course of 20 years and in collaboration with our contracted provider community, Health Partners has used a wide variety of tools to support this transition to payment models that focus on improving quality and aligning payment to reward those who deliver high quality most efficiently. The proposal sequences the transition from current Medicare payment models to a similar permanent solution that rewards value instead of volume, and given the scope of Medicare, this transition could reinforce the welcome transition already underway in the commercial health care finance system. In short, the precedent is there, the tools are available, and the opportunity for Medicare and the nation's entire health care system is enormous. We're pleased to support this important, thoughtful work. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear here today. Doctor, thank you very much. We're joined, I, I should note, uh, by Representative uh, Black and Representative Schwartz. Thank you both for your interest. Um, reading through the testimony, and I appreciate you getting it to the committee well in advance so we could study it. You know, it seems to be clear that, that you're convinced we can base payments on quality measures that getting those measurements right is very important. The collaborative approach in which, you know, a physician who's isolated is going to have more trouble than one that's in a system that gives them t timely feedback so they can continue to make the adjustments to quality care, uh, and that it's important that as we create this formula, we not only reward physicians for improving the quality of care, but we also reward them for maintaining a high level of quality of care going forward. Let me start with my first question, Dr. Cornier. And I say to all of you, I like the process that we've taken here where we continue to share the framework of where we want to go, seek input from you, you know, in two different rounds of input. I hope that's working for physician organizations. I think it's going to create a better uh, product at the end of the day. But Dr. Cornier, you've been doing this for 20 years. Your own experience 
13 physician practice. So that would translate to many of our communities. One of my concerns <coughs> is heaping another round of quality indicators and paperwork and bureaucracy on top of physicians who are not only struggling with uh, a dramatic increase in paperwork and overhead, um, separate quality indicators from private insurance as well, a lot of bureaucracy with ele electronic medical records. So my question is, can we achieve this without adding more burdens on to local physicians? And your experience at Health Partners, have you focused on the key indicators that matter rather than a, a laundry list that may have various value? Boy, we sure have tried to. And um, I think one of the consequences of an engaged and collaborative approach to doing this is that the provider organizations in our community, in our marketplace, have held us accountable to a commitment as health plans in our market to use those agreed to mar uh, measures, not create uh, the kind of uh, confusion that can occur when health partners, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Medica and others in our marketplace have little variations on the same general principles. We have agreed as a market on things like comprehensive diabetes measures, where actually achieving the goals and the clinical targets for those patients is the objective, but we all use those same measures as the foundation for any quality improvement incentives that we put in place. We also think it's important to have both process measures those things that indicate whether or not you're on a day-to-day -day basis reliably delivering care uh, in the ways that we know are clinically and scientifically sound, but also outcomes measures that are reflective of what's important to patients as well. And that varies, I understand, looking at the graph you sent, is that varies by the type <coughs> of medical care provided, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Did physicians within the practice, um, do they have practices where they tend to focus on one or two of those types of, of medical conditions versus a broad range that would require you to keep up with a, you know, just a laundry list of, of indicators? Well, you know, it's evolved actually. As a primary care physician, um, we don't really have the luxury of focusing on just one topic, although as we phased this in, we did get our feet wet, we got our skills up to speed based on, in our case, diabetes measures. Because we could create systems that reliably sustained performance on diabetes, we could then move on to other things like cardiovascular disease, preventative services, and actually manage a pretty long list, but do so in a way where the systems that supported us in doing that worked well. And we did that in a system that didn't have a big uh, multi-specialty, thousand-member physician group to do it. I'm not a fan of Washington picking out a regional model, injecting it full of bureaucracy and deeming it for the rest of the country, but clearly, your experience shows that, that there's the foundation in place that we can learn from. Is your belief that we can take approaches like yours and put them in place in Medicare in a reasonable time frame? Yeah, I think this is a nice combination of a privately developed but collaborative approach to doing this work. And we do think that one of the real values of that is that provider groups could look to the health plans who are driving towards a consistent signal in terms of clinical quality and the kind of incentives that they put in place and take the risks to make the changes that they needed to to drive towards better performance on those selected measures. Anything that CMS can do in those regions, and I think that those regions exist all across the country, to reinforce those signals without interfering with some of that work that's going on uh, would be a delightful trans translation of that work into improving quality for the uh, patients who are served by CMS and Medicare. Great. I, I also I actually have a boatload of questions for all of you, but for the sake of time, let me, uh, let me yield to uh, Dr. McDermott. I suspect the chairman and I and all the committee have a boatload of questions. Um, all of you have said one way or another that we're going to be involved with the fee-for-service system for quite some period of time. It's not going to go away with a snap of the finger. And we all know that. So the question is, how do we make a transition that makes sense in the delivery of health care as well as fiscal sense to the United States Congress who's paying for it? That's really the trouble or that's the balance we're struggling for. And I, I would like to hear from 
you because I, we, we look at RUC and we look at all these things and we, we look at how fee schedules have been developed since 1992. Uh, prior to that, Medicare was fee for service, just send in your fee and we'll send you whatever. Then we put in the fee schedule and since then we've had this continual question about how much we're paying. And I would like to hear from you what you think are the w best measures by which you decide how much you pay. Now, we, we heard a little bit about the quality, national quality form. And, and the question of whether somebody should set a standard outside and it be applied nationwide, or is it something that we let everybody decide uh, on the basis of whether the patients like what they, what's the quality standard you're going to use that will make the most sense in trying to pay on the ability, on the basis of quality rather than quantity? Because treating a diabetic patient is somewhat different than treating a patient, a, a pediatrician who teaches a mother how to be a new mother and breastfeeds and all those things that go on in, in a pediatric office is not the same as adjusting the amount of sugar that a diet, that a uh, endocrinologist does. So how do you set measures that make real sense? I'd like to hear all your ideas. Starting with you, Dr. Cornier. You've been trying it. Uh, yeah, actually, um, one of the things I'd like to, to say about the NQF endorsement process, that tends to turbocharge our work because that lends credibility to the providers in our community, so that that's an important part. Total cost of care measure that we have in our marketplace is one example of that, and that's been a really powerful engagement tool. I do think that we need to have the flexibility to be able to understand that different broad categories of providers will have different focus areas where the quality metrics are most important. And so, for instance, in pediatric clinics, um, those kinds of measures that reflect effective management of um, the common conditions in pediatrics, the preventative services that they provide, whereas with family medicine it's going to be a different suite of measures. But they're all relatively short in number, and for each individual specialty they can be manageable. And we've done that, we've seen it happen in our marketplace. I also think it's important, before we can go and give attention to total cost of care, as I said in the statement, we need to be able to credibly prove that we are t paying attention to clinical quality in measures that are meaningful. We also ha have to pay attention to issues of access and satisfaction. The truth is, is that it's only through establishing a long-term relationship with my patients that I'm going to have the kind of opportunity to have a real impact on their uh, health over time. And both cl clinical quality and satisfaction are part of what cements that relationship over time, and it's, it's important to recognize. Are the data that you get right now from or that Medicare makes their decision. Is it good data? Do you think we're gathering the right data? I well, so um, it's open to all of you, so <laughs> jump in. So from the national quality perspective, we've been moving across different data streams. Beginning with claims data, it's at least a start to get certain aspect of performance measurement on the table. But as you move through different payment systems, you have to map the different the quality metrics and the goals within that system to different sets of measures. The, as we are moving in the NQF and we look at what's happening with clinical data rather than claims data, with clinical registries rather than non-registry-based data, we move the performance measurement system into a much more robust system. And so moving from a claims-based system for performance measurement in the real clinical data drives much higher fidelity in the performance measurement world. And then if that maps to a payment system, we push those together. Yeah, I, I'd like to speak to this from the standpoint of, of, a, of a surgeon trying to participate in quality assessment for payment, but, but all the other things that they need to participate in. And what we found is that registry data is critical. Claims data is, is probably uh, inadequate for a lot of the things that ultimately they need to participate in. And for example, the Joint Commission requires that you uh, demonstrate that you have ongoing practice performance assessment. That's a standard. 
and to be able to do that you need to individually credential east for each physician every two years and in in a cycle in between maintenance of certification for board certification requires now submission of data based on your practice that's reflective of your actual practice and your your qualification to then sit for subsequent examination is based on that kind of data pqrs or performance data that could be quality uh, linked also needs registry data. So what we're doing to anticipate that, and really to, to your, your question, uh, Chairman Brady, in terms of how to sort of lessen the burden for physicians, we're trying to collect data that can be used for all of these things so that as in the context of practice, a physician is, is collecting patient, patient data that's relevant to all the regulatory and payment things that they participate in. And it's, it's actually very straightforward. So we've developed, for, for instance, a, a physician or a surgeon-specific registry that allows multiple things to be, be achieved at the same time. And, and it, it makes it then very straightforward. Great. Thank you. Mr. Johnson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Dr. Cornea, is Medicare and Medicaid paying you when you well, send in a request? Yeah, they are. Are they really? All the time? Well, as far as my business office tells me. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm especially interested in your assessment of small, that small practices can do well in your payment system. Could you elaborate on this point and give some examples? Sure. That, you know, that's an important issue to me personally. Uh, I grew up in northern Minnesota, a small community. And, um, and, and so it's really important to me that solutions that might work in a population uh, concentrated area can find a way to translate into small group practices uh, or individual practices. In fact, in our marketplace, um, some of the top performers in clinical quality are actually those who um, are single uh, solo practitioners, which is to me a refreshing signal that we're getting it right. Um, the way it works actually for us is that those folks in those environments are as engaged in the collaboration around clinical quality and learning from others in the marketplace about how to change the way they practice. And by supporting them in those transitions from the current model practice to an alternative payment model, uh, we've seen really important improvements. I think that those small communities, those um, one or two physician practices, are actually the ones most burdened by the current fee-for-service model in some ways because the only way their business can get any payment for work that they do is for them to be on the treadmill running as fast as they can. And any um, alternative ways of delivering those care, uh, that care that they may see, they can't do because the payment model isn't flexible enough to let them do that. So we actually think that these kinds of payment models, supported with the kind of infrastructure and um, the kind of transitional uh, support that we have used in our marketplace can really have an impact both in inner city uh, concentrated areas as well as rural communities, and we've seen it working. Yeah, you know, I'm impressed by what Health Partners has done to evolve its payment system to support and reward quality of care. I appreciate the description of how you've done it and how it works for small physician practices. I realize your system must work for physicians for you to have come this far, but I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on what a contract physician would say if asked about his or her experience with health partners. Well, there's a couple of things. First, um, let, me, let me reflect back on what I first said back in the early 90s when some of this stuff started to march out. Um, I wasn't terribly happy, to be honest. Um, the idea of transparency around my performance implied that maybe I wasn't performing as well. What's worse was when we did actually do that measurement, I found out that I wasn't, our clinic wasn't, and in fact the general community wasn't performing as well as they thought they should. So the early reaction is very similar to many of the things that we've heard. Uh, right now, I'm actually quite proud of the fact that I think that we as a health plan have really very positive, productive relationships and in fact have worked very hard to make sure that financial performance around our contracts reflect a shared um, set of objectives and a shared stake in uh, success. So I think that after that time of collaboration, we've had good well, success. What did you change to make it better? Because you well, said you weren't satisfied with it. Uh, 
me as a physician? Well, first of all, when I saw that we weren't performing as well as we could, um, uh, we started to actually track and understand our patients. All we had was a, a spreadsheet and a paper record. Um, and we used very simple tools to track and follow up on patients after they had left the office and help support them. One of the things that's important, was important for me to realize is that sitting in an exam room as a, a physician, the plan that I gave them may not necessarily translate into something that they can actually do. So we got much more involved in making sure that what we were recommending, we were giving them support to actually uh, be able to execute on. So by extending our relationship to our patients to that period of time between the visit, we were able to make a big difference in the quality outcomes. And we did so um, with very simple approaches. I'm very excited about the way things are evolving right now because I feel as if the tools to be able to do that in service to our patients are just exploding now and it's a very exciting time for that. I think a real opportunity for us to be able to demonstrate improved quality at the same time we can pay attention to the uh, thoughtful use of the resources. Great. Thank you, sir. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Kind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you uh, for holding yet another, I think, very important hearing. I want to thank the panelists for your testimony today. Dr. Cornier, I've been through your facilities in Hudson and New Richmond, and I, I commend the work that's being done there. It seems as if you've been quite successful in being able to marry up the, the quality and the cost metrics, trying to drive for better outcomes at a better price. And listening to your opening testimony to it, it sounds as if you believe this is sustainable and can be transferred broad-based throughout the system. It's not just something unique that you're doing, but something that is translatable to other areas. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, we think so quite strongly. In fact, one of my favorite examples uh, is in western Wisconsin. Uh, I was on the board of directors for the Osceola Medical Center for several years and um, got to know folks there and over in Amory, Wisconsin as well. And as a part of a collaborative framework, a number of the critical access hospitals got together and um, decided on how they would serve their communities with a cancer treatment center that was a shared resource. What that did is it created a, a resource for treating cancer patients that was, a sh that was shared, that did not duplicate uh, the uh, investment unnecessarily, and produced uh, a rural solution uh, to a very real problem that was disrupting the lives of those patients in ways that was unnecessary. So I think that's a great example where the model focused on efficient use of resources and high quality care can really have an application. I'd love to follow up with you on that. I'm co-chairing the, the Rural Healthcare Caucus with Captain McMorris Rogers, too, and uh, right. I think the unique needs that exist in rural America, too, is something we can't neglect in that. But Dr. Opelka, uh, NQF, uh, is that becoming the standard? Are people looking to your organization as uh, the standard bearer as far as quality measurements and outcomes, and, and how are you getting the buy-in? Yeah, the, the, the value of the NQF is the rigor of making sure we don't misclassify. That's the biggest risk when you get in this performance measurement business. If the measures aren't adequately tested and they're put out there and we misclassify a physician or we misclassify a hospital, we misdirect patients. So it, it's been a rigorous process. It's been an evolution. We've been getting faster at how we do it, which is making the standard more usable, more friendly. But it's really that dedication to the science and the rigor so that we avoid misclassification. And we've seen it from measures that have not gone through the process where they end up with, with creating a misguided end result. Sure. So we're wedded oh. to that as a standard. I didn't hear anyone on the panel uh, mention the value-based modifier. It's a work in progress right now through CMS. It will be fully implemented by 2017. Uh, so it's just around the corner here. Does anyone have any thoughts as far as what's going on with the value modifier concerns or the direction that it's taking right now? the physician-based value modifier. Dr. Cutler, do you know what? Uh, sure, I know about it. Uh, the ECP uh, is not really prepared to object to it at this point. Uh, our position is that uh, payment reform should uh, move towards team-based care. So uh, the value-based modifier would not really be necessary if we could get to uh, more of a team-based care model. Right, yeah. Uh, anyone else have any thoughts on physician-based modifier, Dr. Hoy? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the context is ultimately what will be 
selected to be the component measures that, that judge one specialist versus another specialist or uh, primary care versus, you know, team care might be appropriate for, for primary care right. uh, in some circumstances, but uh, for a surgeon it might be uh, your surgical infection rate, your DVT prophylaxis uh, measurement, uh, your compliance with bundles of, of uh, safety uh, in a hospital, so a, a very different kind of measure set. I mean, we see that as, as really the prototype for how this, this whole quality link to payment would, would actually exist. Right. And the details of the VBU are, are still you know, being worked out, but the, the concept is to link quality measures to, to, to payment, and, and that's, I think, the I context couldn't agree of the with VBU. You more. Now, we received a gift by, from CBO just a couple of months ago on the recalculation of the cost in SGR. They might be fleeting because they're going to do another recalc uh, this month, I believe, so we'll see where they end up. We'll see where they end up uh, with all of that. But it seems that we got to change the incentives so it is value-based, not volume, so that we're uh, paying physicians based on the quality of work and not how much work they ultimately do. And Dr. Corning, I believe your physicians are salary-based. Is that correct? You know, actually not. Um, in our medical group, it used to be that way, um, part partly as a consequence of the change in the way payment occurred over the 90s and into the 2000s. Um, we did go to uh, production-based compensation. We do have a substantial portion of that uh, compensation, though, is related to clinical quality outcomes, and we drive that into, a, into our culture quite deeply. Um, I do think that uh, we can align the incentives properly. Uh, we can create a situation where we have shared objectives and shared trajectories, whether we're payers or providers or patients who we're responsible for. And I do think also that uh, as, long as, the, as long as the signals are directionally consistent, as long as the measures are uh, parsimonious in terms of not driving uh, providers crazy, we can create strong directional market signals that can make a big difference and will actually create an opportunity to transform the way we pay for care over the course of well, the I'd love to follow up with you and see how you're accomplishing that because, uh, and also how much risk the physicians are actually yeah. taking on themselves. But Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roskam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have three colleagues on our committee who have one thing in common, and that is they went into medicine as physicians uh, when medicine was attracting the best and the brightest. That is Dr. Price and Dr. McDermott and Dr. Bastanti. I kind of have a lot of fun lumping the three of those together, and they're not sure if that's a compliment or whatever. I mean it as a compliment. And um, But teasing aside, I, uh, I come from a family with three siblings who are physicians. And what I've observed is that <clears throat> the joy of going into medicine has been largely been ground out, basically, by these larger systems. And um, it is incumbent upon us, if we're going to be dealing with the physician shortage that is looming, we've got to figure out a way to bring the joy of medicine back into medicine and um, to bring the buoyancy and that sense of healing as opposed to check the box and feeling um, very defensive about the whole environment. There's one statistic that I think it's important for us to be mindful of, and that is provided to us by the Association of American Medical Colleges, and they project that we're going to be facing a physician shortage in 2020, which is just around the corner, of at least 91,000 physicians, and that's going to that's going to grow w w in another five years, 2025, to 130,000 physicians. So here's the question, Dr. Cornea: Can you can you give the committee a perspective of you as a physician and the physicians that you're interacting with? on two issues that are sort of looming. One's sort of been l well litigated, no pun intended, and one is uh, upon us. That is defensive medicine to the extent that it actually drives your behavior and, and has an adverse impact on the doctor-patient relationship. And if the tort liability system were somehow changed, would that create a, a better system? Is it overstated? Is it understated? Can you give us your perspective as somebody who's treating patients? And the other is how significant is the Independent Payment Advisory Board that's going to be coming in uh, with the Affordable Health, uh, with the Affordable Care Act. Can you give us your perspective? Sure. A, a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, uh, just on the best and brightest, 
I have the, the great pleasure of actually meeting a lot of the new folks coming in, still attracting them, and that's really exciting. I think one of the things that's ground joy out of medicine is that treadmill that everybody's on, uh, that is in response to the way the market is set up as it exists right now with fee-for-service payment. With regards to um, the medical liability, you know, I, that's also something that seems to me to be uh, varying based on the marketplace. In our own marketplace, liability uh, is not really a very big issue. Uh, and so speaking to it from our experience, all I can say is that it is not a big part of what's on the table. I can't speak to the way that affects people emotionally in other marketplaces. I know it does, and I know that even in our marketplace, it's in the back of our, our mind. One thing I would say, though, is that in our experience, well supported with information, physicians with the time to have conversations with their patients uh, actually feel a lot less concerned about that. Mm. And I think also that patients feel a lot less concerned about that as well. It's really the rapid pace uh, and the situation that we're in right now where we don't have the time to understand the patient's needs from their perspective so that when we come up with a plan for care, it's properly matched to those needs. With regards to the IPAB, um, you know, I, I think there's a broader question about having available information, and this really comes from my perspective as a family physician. There are so many treatments out there um, that I don't have good information to sit down with my patient and make decisions about which ones are the most efficient, the most effective, and match them best. So regardless of the source of information, I think we do need, whether it's a result of uh, private or public effort, we do need information about how things work, one compared to the other. As far as the uh, specific solutions, um, I think it's more general direction that I'm most interested there. Dr. Like, Williams? Thank you. I'd like to comment on the uh, concept of dispensive medicine as an imager. Um, it's long been discussed that there are unnecessary tests that are being done in, in the name of defensive medicine where folks are afraid that if they uh, tell a patient, for example, who comes in and asks for a test uh, that, no, it's really not indicated, that if something bad happens to that patient, um, that they will get sued. And so this has been scored by CBO multiple millions of dollars, and, and that's been going on for quite a while. We are, as the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, as well as the American College of Cardiology, are both in favor of indemnification of physicians for following guidelines that are accepted. That is, if we are able to uh, use the appropriate use criteria and be able to tell that patient or the physician who's ordering a test that this test is really not indicated and we're okay with that, um, then we really shouldn't have to pay the penalty on the other side uh, for following good guidelines. So we're very much in favor of that. Thank you. I yield back. Great. Thank you. Mr. Blumenauer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I very much appreciate uh, the range of opinions uh, presented here today and uh, actually the certain co coherence about it in terms of looking forward to something that is a more uh, coherent and effective way to reward uh, effective practice of medicine. Um, I think this is something that we need to continue pushing forward on. I have um, my own personal bias that the, uh, that the cost of this is overstated because every single year we kick it down the road we're never going to implement the cut to the SGR unless there's a breakdown in the system. Um, so I'm at some point hopeful that we can wipe the slate clean and move forward with you. Um, I would like to begin, if I could, uh, Dr. Cornea, your, uh, because I come from a community, metropolitan Portland, Oregon, where I think the practice patterns are very similar. Uh, to what you enjoy in your uh, service territory and in particularly in metropolitan uh, Minneapolis. Your comments about uh, the difference it makes for people to be able to communicate and understand that uh, in each case I, I get the sense that uh, a lot of people in the medical profession are um, harried. <laughs> they don't have the time they want. Uh, which leads perhaps to uh, default testing for whatever reason. Um, it's one of the reasons why I personally have been on a crusade for the last five years to uh, have the federal government pay physicians or other medical professionals to talk to patients that face end-of-life situations. Uh, 
and their families so they know what they're getting into um, and that their wishes, regardless of what they may be, are enforced. Um, I'm curious to have your observations about how much time is going to be necessary to be able to make this transition using some of the indications that you have and others that we're working on to be able to make that transition from uh, volume to value. And maybe Dr. Correa, if you could start and other observations about what, what, the, what the time frame, how quickly could we do this right? Um, again, I'll reflect back on some experience in the 90s, partly to make a point. Uh, again, at that time, with nothing but a paper-based system and a spreadsheet, within five years, we were clearly performing on multiple measures at a, at a level that was consistent with our biggest competitors in our marketplace. So we were able to do that with basic, very basic tools uh, and attention to the process, and also with a, with a mental framework that distributed the work for doing that stuff to a broad team, so it reinforces the comments that we've heard earlier about team-based care, making a lot of those conversations more possible. In the context that we're in right now, particularly because many markets in this country have learned how to do that, and given the tools that we have available now that are much more robust than we had back then, I do think that that three to five year timeline to building the skills to be able to demonstrate the ability to deliver on quality and setting the stage for delivering on quality, sustaining that performance, and then giving good attention to uh, resource use is possible. Within the context of the Affordable Care Act. Other observations, gentlemen? Dr. Hoyt? Yeah, I, I'd like to comment because I, I think to really accelerate the pace of what you're asking for, we really need to invest in information systems. And I don't mean the electronic medical record per se. I mean data registries, data to physicians, and we need to then incentivize, in addition to individual physician behavior, we need to incentivize collaboratives or physicians working together to common uh, uh, solutions that, that, that come out of the data that they examine. Those two elements are really the, the two major features that lead to, to change. And so if you can invest in them and, and, and incentivize them, that's what we're seeing with our registries and our, and our collaboratives. So that when you, you can get a group of physicians, a group of hospitals to work together, they have data that they can review together, they will come together and share and, and move toward best practice. They, they, they do it automatically. Dr. And, and the biggest inhibition is, is the finances behind Dr. that. Dr. Cutler, did you want to come? Yeah, just to add, uh, it's the position of the ACP that uh, the American College of Physicians, there are um, hundreds of practices, thousands of doctors that have now incorporated team-based care, the patient-centered medical home, uh, into their practices. Uh, those practices, because of the team-based nature, uh, can provide the services that you speak about. The physicians have the time to talk to the patients about the complex nature of their illnesses, and other members of the team can also supply medical information to them. So there are enough practices in the view of the ACP that we could begin implementing uh, these programs and incentives right now uh, there are so many different fits that some are ready to go, some are two-thirds ready to go, some are one-third ready to go, and it's, it's our belief and part of our testimony that as, as soon as 2014, uh, we could roll out uh, these systems rewarding folks who are more uh, mature in the market at a higher uh, percent than those who are halfway there uh, and, and still allow enough time for the small practices and the practices that have not become team-based uh, over the next four to five years to develop those team-based models. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Dr. Price? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to uh, join those who uh, are commending the Chairman and um, our staff for putting together this, uh, this hearing. I think this is extremely important. And I want to commend all of the panel members as, as a fellow physician. It's, it's a hard time for docs out there taking care of patients. And I want to commend each of you for what you're doing to try to improve the system and move it in a positive direction for, for patients. Uh, language is important, and, and uh, a number of folks have used the word reimbursement for what uh, uh, CMS does to physicians caring for Medicare patients. I would suggest that NS, the SGR formula is not a reimbursement formula. 
it's a payment uh, system, and it oftentimes doesn't cover the costs of providing the care. So we're not reimbursing docs for a doggone thing. We're paying them for something, and sometimes it, 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 it works, and oftentimes um, uh, it doesn't. I want to uh, uh, just touch on, it's a different topic, but Dr. Williams mentioned utilizing specialty society guidelines as an affirmative defense in a court of law to end the practice of defensive medicine. Uh, we, we have been working on this for a number of years, and, and thank you for that, that note, and um, look forward to continuing to work with each of you on getting us to a system where we can end the practice of defensive medicine, which I believe in others wastes hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, I think it's always important we, we, we talk about patients when we're talking about health care. Uh, and patient access to care right now is being compromised, I would suggest, because of the system. One in three physicians in this country who are eligible to see Medicare patients have decreased or limited the number of Medicare patients that they see. One in eight physicians who are eligible to, to, to see Medicare patients no longer sees any Medicare patients. This is a system that's broken and, and is in dire need of, of fixing. So I want to concentrate on two specific issues. One is flexibility. And two is, is the transition time that each of you, I think at, le uh, four, at least four out of five of you talked about. Uh, Dr. Hoyt and Dr. Cutler, I'd like you to comment on, uh, I, I think there need to be some pressure valve outlets for docs in the system right now because it is, uh, it is so oftentimes so onerous and oppressive. One of those is patient shared billing or balance billing or private contracting uh, voluntarily outside of the system uh, and still allowing physicians to stay in Medicare and patients to stay in Medicare. Is that something that, that ACS and ACP support, Dr. Hoyt? Well, I, I would say that we support it as something that needs to be explored in, in, in greater detail, just as you suggest. And, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, it may be uh, the right uh, model for certain kinds of care. Uh, it may be the right model for certain uh, physician uh, uh, elements, but it's just not clear. And so I think this, to talk about it broadly rather than look at it and study it in context, that would be the appropriate way to do it. Dr. Cutler? My answer is, my, uh, my answer is similar. The ACP does support the concept. Uh, we would uh, <coughs> like it tested initially, and uh, we want to determine that patients are protected. Uh, Understand the uh, in a way. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, I appreciate that, and we look forward to working with you. Patient care wouldn't be yeah. compromised, but thank you. Again. They talk about the, uh, Dr. Williams. Just one quick comment. That's an inner city doctor from Chicago and now Detroit, uh, working in safety net hospitals. The balance billing would actually help us because there are certain patients who would be able to pay the the balance and would help us take care of the people who are really not able to pay at all. And it may not be the intent of the Medicare system to do that but it certainly would help us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me switch to the transition because uh, uh, most folks uh, uh, have talked about a period of time of transition. I think five years, as many of you have stated, is an important period of time. During that transition, though, I, I, I hope that it's not just a period of time to, to then impose another formula that, that, again, doesn't work. Shouldn't we get the quality measures and all of those things correct? Shouldn't that be our goal during that time of transition, Dr. Cornier, maybe? I think the work on the quality goals is an important first step in getting the skills necessary to know that you can grapple with problems like that. So, um, you know, that has to be a particular point of attention. But I, I think perhaps balanced, too, by the fact that in the commercial market, some of these shared savings and other alternative forms of payment are beginning to unfold, that um, the five-year time frame is one that matches pretty well with what's unfolding in the marketplace well right now. And so the idea of being able to pay attention to resource use and grapple with that issue is one that, uh, because of what's going on in the private insurance marketplace, physician groups are beginning to build the skills to do that. And they're being able to see the value of both that broad view that timely claims information can mm -hmm. give, combined with that narrow but deeper view that their own medical records can give as a really good foundation for making that transition rather rapidly. Dr. Cutler, cart before horse. Uh, if you look at uh, the hundreds or thousands of practices that have gone through NCQA certification, those high-level uh, patient-centered medical homes have built in many uh, quality parameters. Uh, so I think some of the data is out there. and. If you also look at the results of practices that are patient-centered medical homes, we're seeing that hospital admissions are down, 
uh, huge percentages, readmissions are down, costs are down. So the patient-centered medical home, I, I think, has built in some of the quality measures successfully uh, that you're referring to, and the result is the costs are down, uh, patient satisfaction and professional satisfaction among those physicians is also quite high. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Pras Pascro. Mr. Chairman, thank you for this hearing, and each of the uh, participants have been excellent, excellent. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to clear up one thing that Dr. Price was getting into, if I may. Uh, from every account that I've seen, private contracting threatens the very health of America's senior citizens and people with disabilities. When out-of-pocket costs increase, uh, patients will visit doctors less, obviously. These arrangements outside of Medicare would only deter beneficiaries from seeking preventive and other care until their illness worsens. Now, every report I've seen, I look at other reports, uh, but I, that's my conclusion. So we've heard some uh, specific recommendations. Um, want to transform, we want to transform the system as it exists right now. As you know, Mr. Chairman, in 2009, the Democrats uh, passed the permanent fix for Medicare physician payment, uh, HR 3961. So I think our position is pretty clear, but I must commend you, I must commend Ms. Schwartz uh, and those people who have put some proposals on the table because there's a lot of common factors when you look at all these recommendations. I hope we can with your help, uh, get to the resolution because this cannot be hanging over our heads for the rest of the year or in years to come. It's obvious that there is a, some kind of an agreement that the current formula is undermining the Medicare program. It is threatening physician participation and beneficiary access to care. So we can't afford these short-term patches. Doctors Cutler and uh, Carniva, many of you know in the reform bill, uh, we included a national healthcare work, workforce commission, worked very hard on that to get it into the bill, and associated uh, grants to help states improve their efforts to promote an adequate healthcare workforce, not only among docs, doctors, but also among nurses and assistants. We can't ignore the growing shortages of doctors, nurses, and allied health professionals. While payment changes can help, there's much more we can do. I mentioned we took some very important steps under the Health Care Reform Act. Very seldom is it referred to, because we're always dealing with the sexy stuff on the top and realizing that there's a lot of good stuff in there, too. This is particularly true when it comes to primary care prof uh, uh, professionals. I think you would agree with me. So both of you, can you talk about programs that advance primary care practice? If there's anything your organization is doing to address health workforce issues. Uh, Speaking for the American College of Physicians, uh, you've touched on something we're very concerned about, and uh, sure, primary care uh, has a shortage right now, and uh, the students and the residents, as, as they come out of training, have huge debt. Uh, the, the debt drives their decision away from uh, becoming a primary care doctor. Uh, so we're encouraged by any program that uh, lessens that medical education debt, uh, whether it's loan forgiveness, uh, uh, working in an underserved community somewhere in the country so that the debt can go down. And we would encourage uh, more activity along those lines. Uh, anything that can be done that would lessen debt, uh, in my view, would increase uh, the number of young doctors becoming primary care physicians. It's in their heart. They, they want to do it but they are coming out of training with a mortgage and no house. Thank you. Dr. Kniebe? Well, I think even at least as important as that is that they need to step into practices where there is that joy that was alluded to earlier today. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, talking before the National Health Policy Forum a couple of weeks ago on workforce issues uh, for health care. 
And the reason that I was there was because we have been doing quite a bit of work to transform that team-based model. And um, in the context of that change, what we have found is that physicians can actually see and manage a larger population of patients. They can do so well supported by an extended team of, of providers. And our satisfaction in practice within our own medical group from 2005, when the only thing that we had that was up in the high area was satisfaction with prior authorization process, ironically, has now gone from about the 25th to 35th percentile up to the 85th percentile as a consequence of changing the way physicians work in that practice. We're now in a position in our own medical group where primary care docs are eager to come to us looking for work because they recognize that joy is possible. And that's what's going to draw people into the profession. Thank you. In conclusion, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Mr. Chairman, Excuse I just me. want to bring attention, and we don't have to, my time's run out, on the specialty areas where it's a prolonged illness, and particularly something I've worked on for a long time, and some of us at the panel, brain injury. Uh, in specifically in terms of what we are talking about today. We need to take a very, very special look at, a look at and I know the uh, NKF has been moving in some direction along those lines. It's a very serious problem in our country. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Pascrell. Uh, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a very critical hearing, and as we move forward on SGR, I can't think of anything more important. I think there's a general feeling, I love this feeling, the idea on a bipartisan basis that we can really deal with this once and for all. Uh, I'm in a district in Florida, like many districts in Florida, 70, 80 percent of the uh, revenues for many of our docs are Medicare oriented. So it's important. That's the way they keep the doors open. In my district alone, 180,000 seniors are on Medicare. So it's a very high percentage, but I would say, again, it's not just my district, it's many districts that are in Florida. So I can tell you with our docs, the uncertainty that SGR, this doc fix, has created for them over the last five or six years since I've been here is enormous. And it's not that we might not get it addressed, but they're trying to make capital investments over a period of five or ten years. And the fact that it's constantly looming over there with a 20, 30 percent cut is huge. I'd also just say that as someone that's been in business for 30 years, there is nothing and I say nothing more important than getting this right because is this, the doc here knows that pay for performance, however you want to measure it and look at it, that creates the behavior in the firm. I had 1,200 employees before I came here and the one thing I wanted to get right from the top to the bottom is getting that pay plan right. And that's what we're talking about right here because what you measure is what the behavior you're going to get. So I guess I'd ask the docs to start off on my just my first, on my own observation, I think it's very applicable here, is the fact that this idea we've got to make sure we take the time, the thoughtfulness, as much ideas we can get from yourselves and others to get this right. Uh, and Dr. Holt, do, do you agree with that? Yeah, let, let me give you an example. If the way you can take data that, that's developed by registries and use it to affect behavior is as follows. If you graph it and put each provider, each physician on that graph, there's some on the right that are performing not as well as those on the left that are performing better. Those people on the right, when they see that and you make that data available to them, by the virtue of their commitment to their patients and improving as physicians, they want to move in the direction of improving. And so that's why data is such a, an important and powerful tool to get behavior aligned with, with ultimately quality. If you then add to that their opportunity to come together and learn from each other so that the ones that are performing less well can learn from the ones that are performing well, then you, you affect behavior Thank you, change. Dr. Cornelia. Yeah, you know, I, um, it's, it's a really kind of joyful, remarkable um, acceleration that you see. If, if the incentives can be properly aligned so that quality improvement and the measures are properly selected, uh, so that not only is the incentive aligned, but the incentive and the objectives are aligned with the personal mission that physicians bring to practice, then you begin to marry that important financial element with what is, I think, a much more powerful motivator, and that is the desire to do well by your patients. Um, my mom lives in Florida. 
um, the issue of transparency and the availability of information for her about what care she can get is important to me. And um, any role that um, CMS can play in making that performance what we can expect across all markets is one that I'm very excited Doc, about. Doc, let me ask you, uh, just in general, um, W.C. Deming said that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And I also want to be careful because at the same time I've always said you can't measure 48 things. What are the key things that need to be considered and measured going forward, uh, you know, for docs across the country? Yeah. Um, but, you know, actually there's, there's one measure that I thought was particularly transformational for me in practice, and that was the comprehensive diabetes measure. The reason that was important is because there were five elements that we had to perform on. And it wasn't just measuring it, it was actually getting our patients to goal for those five elements. We knew that we couldn't achieve that unless we really changed the way we approached care. So I think that there are certain high impact measures like that that uh, are important. Cardiovascular disease is another one. It's the place where the money is. It's also the place where the human suffering is. And so selecting those in ways that uh, create the kinds of force that requires substantial change is really important. Those are the two that come to mind, but there are a number of others. Uh, I, I would say preventive services is a good Dr. Idea. Cutler, I, I just got a few minutes. Uh, any, your thoughts on either of those questions or observations? Uh, um, it's really tough is the answer. Uh, I mean, every patient I see is a little bit different. Uh, and so, sure, there are some very common diseases like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, but um, getting down into the weeds on that and, and listing the specific ones is really difficult. But I, I do want to go come back to uh, a, a practice that is patient-centered, that's uh, a high-level functioning patient-centered medical home, by very definition, has um, many of the quality metrics built into that certification. Uh, and those homes are doing quite well in terms of, as I said earlier, hospital readmissions, hospital admissions, uh, cost of care. So I think that the essence of, uh, the essence of the answer lies in team-based care and uh, certified uh, medical homes. Thank right. you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Schwartz. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and the series of hearings, with, particularly for this panel. Um, we don't always have a panel that has so much agreement, so I'm uh, really very pleased to see the consistency of uh, both an intention uh, that we should repeal this SGR permanently and replace it with a new payment system that does reward uh, quality and outcomes, uh, improve care, and cost containment. Uh, and many of you have talked to the fact that we can begin to measure it, that we can do this well, and particularly with uh, the kind of work that's been done already in delivery system reforms, both in the private sector and through Medicare Innovation Center, Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Center. I thank you for participating in this and really getting it done uh, out there in the real world, as we, we say. But how we pay makes a difference and can either encourage this transition and this transformation uh, in the way we deliver care, improving health care for, for Medicare uh, recipients uh, or not makes a big difference. Uh, and I would contend many of you talked about, uh, and I want to thank doc Dr. Cutler, who's here from my district, actually, and practices in Norristown, Pennsylvania, lives in my district, and ACP has been very, very helpful, as many of you have, in, in helping me write that legislation to create a new payment for, uh, system for doctors under Medicare. Uh, I hope we get that done. There's a lot of agreement uh, uh, and common ground on this, and uh, many of you have really articulated the, what we have to do, which is to repeal SGR, provide some stability and updates for physicians, focus on primary care, I haven't talked about it as much, but it's going to be my question, uh, and really move over the next five years to move more physicians, really the majority of physicians in this country, to a system with a variety of models uh, for, uh, that could be really incentivizing that kind of quality. Uh, and value-based purchasing of care. So I thank you for, for what you're doing and uh, moving in this direction. Uh, I did want to focus on just uh, two things, if I may. You talked a, bit, a good bit, many of you, about doc particularly uh, Dr. Pania and, and uh, Dr. Cutler. Thank you for talking a lot about team-based care models, uh, particularly about the transitions of care and the what happens to patients when they leave your office or leave the hospital and what you thought you did all the right things and gave them their instructions and 
lo and behold, they didn't all understand them and do it all exactly the way you thought they might. And leaving out that time, it turns out to be pretty critical in terms of cost and readmissions and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and care. Uh, so I wanted to ask two questions, if I may. And that is, if you could talk a little bit more, I'll start with Dr. Cutler, but I think uh, Dr. Kania might want to mention, talk about this as well, the, the focus on primary care and how important that is to hel helping enable all specialists and all uh, physicians uh, and all primary care physicians to actually provide the right kind of care to patients and the degree to which we have to or should be making sure that we, we focus on both re increasing reimbursements and then also just making sure that the models that we move forward on actually include primary care. Uh, that's my first question. And then secondly, about the ability of the system to really move in this direction in the next four to five years and whether we, d your point, I would like to ask you, whether we should get started right now to make that happen. So both those questions, and Dr. Cutler, if you'd start. Uh, thank you, Representative Schwartz. Uh, obviously, we have a, a a huge shortage uh, in this country in primary care physicians. Um, and what is it that patients really want from their doctor? Well, they want the opportunity to talk to the doctor. They, they want the time. And, and the current system, which takes us back really to the opening comments from Chairman Brady, is that the current system is volume driven. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and it de-emphasizes time. So I, I think the, the solution that we have to uh, aim for is one uh, that rewards the ability of the doctor and the patient to sit and talk together uh, and to decide what's best for their care. A team-based care, in my view, takes us right to the finish line on that, uh, and, and it it uh, does it in a way, and we're seeing it across the country, that's really very cost effective. It, primary care services drive costs down. Right. Um, and obviously, if you're treated for osteoporosis by a primary care doctor, your uh, incidence of hip fractures has gone down. Uh, it's very expensive to take care of a hip fracture. It's considerably less expensive to treat osteoporosis. You can go through a whole series of diseases and many cancers could be cured, discovered very early, and we won't need all of these expensive uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agents and, and radiation treatments and surgery. Mm -hmm. So primary care is really the answer. It's a financial answer. It's an answer for the patients because they appreciate it. And finally, uh, and this was mentioned earlier, professional satisfaction, the satisfaction among, among the doctors and the members of, of the care team is the highest of any model. It's considerably higher and it gets away from all of the complaining that doctors do about not having time. So I think the answer lies in uh, patient-centered care and team-based care. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. and certainly thank you to our panel here today. Uh, just going over some of my notes here uh, and uh, bio, uh, biography uh, statements uh, for our panel here, I, I see uh, FFS, NSQIP, ACS, ASNC, NQF, CSAC. Of course, we're talking about SGR in a place called DC. But I, I only mention that because I think it's a reflection of some well-intending efforts uh, of those associated with government to, to try to create a better situation. And, uh, and yet, SGR, although well-intended, has not been uh, impacting the situation as we would prefer. And I, it's very compelling when I hear uh, that uh, patients themselves, uh, for which there's no acronym uh, description, uh, ha are seeing reduced access. Uh, because of the obvious uh, fiscal realities that exist. And, and that's without the next wave of, uh, of health care uh, reform uh, efforts that I, I already sense are, are seeing uh, some resistance. So uh, with that said, I, I also know that uh, we're seeing some consolidation in, uh, in, in health care. Physicians kind of leaving their independent practices to join larger practices 
whether or not under hospital umbrella or not. Um, and, and I'm concerned that uh, patients may not benefit uh, from, from these changes. And so if you could perhaps uh, elaborate uh, when you take the consolidation issue, uh, whether it's in rural areas or, or urban areas as well, uh, what is the impact uh, uh, with SGR, uh, whether you think it does not uh, have any relationship whatsoever or, or patients should not be concerned or providers themselves should not be uh, concerned uh, if any of you would like to respond. Dr. Cutler. Uh, well, uh, the ACP doesn't have policy on this, but just personally, I, I've been on both sides of, of the fence. I was... Uh, Self-employed, I, I owned my practice for most of my career. Uh, just recently, I've begun to work for a small hospital network. I, I think the, the key really lies in uh, the physicians, whether it's a two-doctor group or hundreds of doctors, uh, the physicians being uh, able to make the decisions that are best uh, for their patients. So uh, it, in a network like mine, which uh, has a, a great deal of physician input, uh, into uh, the decisions that are made uh, from a business standpoint. Um, I feel qu quite comfortable working there. Uh, if the physicians are not in charge, uh, I would worry about a system like that. Dr. Williams. Yes, thank you, Representative Smith. I, as an imager, again, of, on the hospital side, university side, I've watched the influx of physicians that during this consolidation. And the concern is that um, as Medicare has decreased payment to the uh, fee schedule less than the hospital outpatient prospective payment system, uh, it drives people into a system that ultimately costs Medicare more money. It does cost the patient more money to come away from their physician to a major facility in terms of travel and time, but more importantly, um, it, it, it takes away the uh, on-site freedom of practice sort of uh, environment that has uh, allowed the uh, imaging to flourish and to help people. Now, obviously, some things had to be reined in. Um, there was a time when there were that nuclear cardiology probably sitting at this table only because of this. It was the number one Medicare expenditure. That was about 2004, 2005, uh, before the fees were cut dramatically. The volume has gone down largely because of appropriate use criteria and, and getting people to certify in their, in their specialty and to make sure that labs were accredited. That was the MMA of uh, 2010, that if you're not accredited, you're not allowed to do uh, nuclear cardiology and other imaging. And so the quality measures really can impact in a positive way uh, how much Medicare spends. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Hoyt. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in specialty care, particularly in surgery, we're seeing a trend toward employment as, as one form of this. And when you add to that then bundling of payments to, to entities or systems as a potential reimbursement model, uh, you know, you create a, a, on the one hand, s some real advantages so that somebody that's part of a bigger system doesn't have the investment costs in electronic medical records, that they may feel uh, less burdened by liability uh, in, in a more protected environment. But I think the concerns about being able to perform at a quality level are really the same, so that we really need the same tools to be able to motivate people to perform quality care. Very briefly, Dr. Cornier. Yeah, it really depends on why they're coming together. We're going to see examples of groups that come together with the objective of serving patients well and competing in an environment where quality and good use of resources is the reward. They're going to do great. We're going to see examples of individual single physician practices who also do great in that environment. We're also going to see examples of people coming together to exercise uh, leverage that may not be as good. It really depends on their objectives and whether they're led uh, in a way that is in the interest of the patients. Very, very good. Thank you. I appreciate uh, and uh, certainly it's my objective that uh, uh, this panel doesn't come or, or anyone else uh, doesn't come uh, between uh, you and your patients. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Smith. As we wrap up, um, one, thank you very much for all five of our witnesses being here. Your experience and ideas are very helpful. Dr. McDermott and I had very quick question, very briefly. It goes to the point of if collaboration is important, timely feedback is important, a team type of practice is important. I understand, we understand how that works in Twin Cities. 
How does that work for a rural doctor? How do you fit a rural doctor that may have another physician in town? It may not be isolated hundreds of miles, but in that type, how, do, how does this fit for them? Uh, the American College of Physicians recognizes the difficulty that uh, the doc or uh, doctors in a small uh, community have, uh, certainly with support resources. And it's for that reason that we think we need five years to transition uh, into these new models of, of care and, and payment. Uh, thankfully, the Internet exists. Uh, a lot can be done. Uh, through electronic technology, uh, but the fact is that um, many of these practices are one or two doctors. Uh, they're on a very tight uh, operating margin, mm -hmm. uh, and they need time to transition into new models. So um, we think it can be done. We think perhaps uh, the recommendation from the College of Surgeons uh, dealing with affinity groups might help uh, the small practices. Uh, if given the time, uh, we can make it work. Very quickly, Dr. Hoyt. Yeah, well, just to add to that, I think we're seeing also some exploration of regionalization, which is probably good for certain types of patients, and uh, vice versa, s larger systems in urban areas supporting rural practices to provide them backup so that they really can feel comfortable practicing in isolation. So it can be done. Yeah. Your answer. Yeah. Um, a reminder, any member on the panel wishing to submit a question for the record will have 14 days do so. If any questions are submitted, I'd ask the witnesses to respond in a timely manner. We are committed to finding a sound solution, permanent solution, a reliable solution for the SGR this year, and we're committed to working together toward that. With that, uh, the meeting is adjourned.